Hello there, I'm Nick, and this is The Game Apologist, where we look for the good in bad... Hmm. Where we look for the good in bad... Uh... Hmm. I, I can't. I'm sorry, I can't. Sonic 3 is so far away from even coming close to being called a bad game, so maybe it's time we switch things up a little bit. Welcome to Unapologetic, where we look for the good in good games. And it's about time we talk about the best Sonic game ever created. Sonic 3 and Knuckles. Yes, fellow Sonic fans, I can feel you rolling your giant merged eyeballs at me. I'm one of those Sonic fans. The correct ones. Those who sing the praises of this title and declare it the very best of the entire series, nay, one of the greatest games ever made. But I'm going to do my best to tell you why. Why this game has stuck with me and so many others after all these years, even in an industry that's constantly evolving at a crazy pace, why does this game matter so much to me? And you could dismiss this as nostalgia, and that certainly plays a part of it, but I think there's more to it. And if you haven't seen any of my prior Sonic videos or you don't know anything about Sonic games, well, go watch my previous videos, or better yet, play the game. Because we're not going to spend a whole lot of time explaining the basics, and this will get very confusing very quickly if you don't understand the important relationship between jewelry and multicolored woodland critters and stylish footwear. But this is Game Apologist, or a spin-off of Game Apologist. So like every other game we cover, or, well, some of the other games we cover, before we get into the good, we should look at the bad. While I do believe this game is a masterpiece, nothing is perfect, so let's get into it. All right, now that we have that out of the way, let's get to the good stuff. It's right here, just past this weird barrel. We just hop on and, uh... Yeah, okay, uh... uh hang, on, hang on a second. We just, um, okay, nope, that's, uh, <laughs> no, hang, hang on, nope, that's it, do I, mean, <laughs> do I jump, or do I, okay, this is, um, all right, can I, I mean, seriously, though, do I jump, this stupid fox is jumping, what, I don't, I don't, what, what is this stupid barrel doing here, this doesn't make any sense, there's nowhere else in the rest of the game, I don't understand why, we're, hey, no, 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 I didn't, I didn't mean that, I didn't mean that. Put that title card away. No, 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 no! <laughs> All right, fine. The game is sprinkled with odd little mechanics and mechanisms that don't really serve much purpose, this barrel being the most offensive culprit. For the most part, I don't see these as a negative, they're just mostly useless, as some of these can actually be kind of fun. It goes back to those jungle gym and playground comparisons I was making in previous episodes. And while this barrel is annoying, some fans do find issue with some other zones, so instead of talking about it right now, we're gonna wait till we talk about it when we cover that zone. So let's just do this level by level, because I have a lot to talk about with this game. Before we do that, anything else bad we should mention up front? Well, um, multiplayer's here. Wouldn't call it bad, it's just nothing to write home about. And I wish this roller coaster theme was made into a proper level, but that's all I really got. I think you just race or something. I, I don't know, man. It's an afterthought, and I'm not gonna waste my time talking about it. The only other crap I could really talk about is... Well, Sonic 3 doesn't really hit its full potential unless you slap the and knuckles on the end there. When Sonic 3 was originally released, I was like in second or third grade at the time, and I didn't really look at this stuff with a critical eye. And I knew I loved what I played, but I distinctly remember my first experience being, well, underwhelming. And as I'd find out half a year later, there was more to this game on another game, which I would get as a Christmas present. Thing is, I had only rented Sonic 3. I liked it fine, but I didn't really feel the need to ask for it as a gift for Christmas since, well, I already beaten it as a rental and there was a brand spanking new Sonic game I had yet to play. So I had a lot of experience playing Sonic 3 and Sonic and & Knuckles as their own games, and they were great. But again, both feel a little incomplete. It's when I finally rented Sonic 3 again and combined the two games that I realized there was something truly special here. And it's true you could pop out Sonic 3 and then swap out carts and play part two with Sonic and Knuckles, but it's really not the same experience. They not only fuse the two games, but they bring in features exclusive on each cart to the other, and unlock a couple of other cool things not available on either until you combine them into one. But why would they do something like this? Were they just trying to make more money? Well, I mean, potentially. The story goes that the combined games are the true version of Sonic 3. They just ran out of development time, so they cut their losses, released Sonic 3 as it was, and then spent the rest of the time creating the rest of the game. And honestly, I think we're better for it. Now, I only bring this up because, well, well, I don't know. I guess it comes down to whether or not you feel each half needs to stand on its own. And if this two-part tactic was pulled off in today's market, would we be alright with it? I mean, considering the other tactics the game industry is pulling off, this doesn't seem so offensive. Now, I've gone on about this because I cannot stress enough that you really need to play Sonic 3 and Knuckles to fully understand why so many of us hold this title in such high
high regard. But that doesn't mean either of these cards don't stand on their own, or have unique values in each title that can be appreciated without the presence of the other. And Sonic 3 by itself only feels underwhelming because of that extensive wonder that was Sonic 2. On its own, still pretty awesome. I've spent enough time in the other videos talking about the core gameplay of Sonic and why I love it so much. They turned a pinball table into a platformer, and they made it work by giving you direct control of the pinball. But like an actual table, you did have to relinquish a little bit of control and bank on a bit of luck thanks to that iconic speed of the series. Unless you've had a bit of practice, it was only a matter of time before you ran your black olive nose into a robot or a spike pit. Sonic 1 being the first game out of the gate would sometimes relinquish Sonic's speed and give you more traditional platformer levels. Going forward, Sonic 2 designed levels to take full advantage of the speed, and CD at the same time made players actively seek out spaces to build and maintain momentum to activate the unique time travel mechanic. Sonic 2 was more about speed, and Sonic CD was more about exploration. So while all these games are similar, you can see why you'll get varied answers when you ask a classic Sonic fan which one is their favorite. They all tackle the simple gameplay in wonderfully different ways. But Sonic 3 & Knuckles takes the very best ideas from all these games and improves upon them. The level designs, the characters, the graphics, the music, bonus stages, oh man, there's a lot to cover here. But since we're taking this level by level, let's just talk about the mechanics as a new player would discover them. Okay, so, you pop this sucker into your Genesis, you turn it on, and the first thing you see is, oh, holy cow. I don't know what it is about the Sonic model, but his big giant balloon head always kind of weirded me out when I was a kid. Anyway, you hit start, and you see something we've never had before in the series. Save files. This already was a huge plus for me as a kid. I was sick and tired of trying to play these games all at once. And you don't have to hop into some irritating options menu to go pick out your character. You play Sonic and Tails, or you can play each of them on their own. And while I've ragged on Tails' design in the past, they've actually made him pretty useful this time around. He can actually fly this time, which is incredibly helpful in this game considering the huge emphasis on exploration. Because of this, he's considered the easy mode. I mean, he can fly over so many problems, it's not even funny. So, I'm not gonna play him here. But if you're new to the game or you're trying to hunt down emeralds, he's an awesome starting choice. Sonic, on the other hand, hasn't changed a whole lot which it's fine by me, don't fix what's not broken. The only difference now is he has this weird little flash if you hit the jump button a second time when he's in the air. And for the longest time, I kind of felt it was useless as a kid, but when I played in the air the game without it, felt a little naked. This quick little flash can give you a little bit more of a hitbox and can reflect some projectiles if you're quick enough. It actually feels kind of awesome if you get the hang of it. But once you pick your character, you then see something we've never seen on the Genesis games before, a cutscene. But we've seen it done before in Sonic CD, so why make us think about it now? Well, that's because this is as perfect of a story telling device as you could hope for for a Sonic game. It doesn't require you to read through a manual, text boxes, or listen to tinny little voices. It tells you everything you need to know in an easy to understand format and gets you on your way. And it works for Sonic because it doesn't waste your time, something that sadly would be a problem in later games. And they managed to improve upon it from CD by not smacking it in the second zone or giving the player a chance to run headlong into spikes. This, ugh, man. It was obvious they wanted their players invested on a deeper level for this adventure. Simply having this cutscene exist is all they needed to make that intention clear. So let's break it down. They start things off by dangling the ultimate prize of the last game, Super Sonic, right there at the get-go. This tells fans a couple of things. One, there is continuity from the previous game. And two, it's also about to tell you why you won't be starting off your adventure with that shiny gold upgrade. And at the same time, if you hadn't played Sonic 2 or maybe just never got all the emeralds, which was a real possibility, speaking out of experience, this tells those players why these shiny gems matter and the potential prize they unlock. And then, BOOM! Get that out of here! Island Justice! Not Knuckles has Island Fix the Boy! An island native comes and robs our spiky blue tourist of all he's worth. This cutscene also establishes just how much of a threat this new red dude is. Granted, this is played up a little bit and would eventually just be another furry fun buddy that would be running around with Sonic as the series progressed, but back in 1994, Knuckles the Enkidna punched his way onto the scene in a big, bad way. Now, at this point, as the game was new, we didn't know a whole lot about Knuckles. So for now, we're only going to analyze what the game is giving us in these few seconds. But thankfully, there's a lot we can glean from this. Knuckles keeps that simple but striking design the Hedgehog is so famous for. He gets his own radical primary color, and his crimson fur displays the intensity and aggression of his persona. Instead of a mohawk, he gets dreadlocks. And while his eye design is kind of similar to Sonic, they're not as wide as his, given 
giving him this constant leering look. <clears throat> Looks like a bit of a bully. I mean, he introduces himself with a fist in your mouth and then cackles about it. His actions, expressions, and design help establish this persona. This nasty little guy mugs you and then runs off into the forest, giving you all the incentive you need to give chase. And just like that, we're off and ready to go. That one little cutscene told us all of that within seconds, making this long, rambling explanation completely pointless. And here's some other stuff you don't need me to point out, but I'm gonna do it anyway. The game looks and sounds fantastic. I know I'm being biased here, but as far as graphics and artistic design goes, I think this game is unrivaled on the Genesis. You have to appreciate the capabilities of a video game machine that came out in 1989 to really get a kick out of what you're seeing and hearing. This game is a technical wonder. As good as the previous Sonic games looked, they were nothing like this. The developers are just showing off what they can do. The music in this first level invokes a tropical vibe to go along with the lush environment. They want you to relax, take this all in, enjoy yourself. Check out these fun little swings. Boop. Fell down into the ravine? No worries, you're gonna land just fine. Heck, you might even find some nifty secrets if you're curious enough. Like I said, there's a much larger emphasis on exploration than compared to Sonic 2, but without it being a chore like it could be in Sonic CD. It's fun, you get awesome rewards, and the layout makes sense and is filled with recognizable landmarks, meaning you probably won't get lost. Like the previous game, this one starts you off in a more natural world, but it doesn't look like another repeat of Green Hill Zone. Angel Island feels completely unique compared to every other starting level that's come before, but still keeps the same basic theme and all the strengths of the previous level designs. And then halfway through the first act? As if they didn't put enough emphasis on how different things would be this time around, they literally set your world on fire. Just as you were getting used to this fun, colorful jungle setting, the game shows you just how real the threat of Robotnik and his robot army are to you and this island, as well as letting you know not to expect the same challenges between acts, even within the same zone. The remainder of your time here will be navigating the forest as it burns down around you, and the music, while keeping that same tropical theme, becomes desperate. The traps and enemies become a little bit more hazardous, but despite all that, the game is still teaching you some stuff, like this brilliant little teaser in the form of puddles. See, in the past Sonic games, water has been a bit of an issue. Sonic Team had established some fairly unique mechanics for Sonic's water traversal, and that in turn changes up the gameplay. Problem is, fans don't usually like water levels, and they certainly didn't like how they were handled in the first Sonic game. Showed up for one level, required you to trudge through it for three grueling acts, then again in a shoddy final level, but otherwise it remained untouched. Sonic CD refined that a bit, but it's basically Labyrinth Zone all over again. Sonic 2 would tackle these issues by putting it in some stressful spots in Chemical Plant, and as a punishment if you take the lower path in Aquatic Ruin, but again, there's not a whole lot of it in the game, and if you're good enough, you probably won't see it at all. Sonic 3, on the other hand, finally found the right balance with the water, making it a smart challenge without overstaying its welcome or making it an underwhelming afterthought. Here in this first level, you have chances to get submerged in tiny spots, and really only one you have to navigate through before you run out of air. This helps new players dip their red shoes into this mechanic, and it also gives you a chance to play around with all three elemental shields, another new feature for this game. Now, all the shields still have the same function they had before, giving you a free hit without losing any rings, but now they come with some additional abilities, and some available only to Sonic. You have the Electric Shield, which magnetically grabs nearby rings and draws them toward your player character, as well as giving Sonic an extra jump ability. Or the Fire Shield, which protects you from fire and lava, and gives Sonic a horizontal fireball attack. And the Bubble Shield, which lets you survive underwater without drowning, and gives Sonic an extra bounce. The first zone has a generous abundance of all three varieties, and ample chances to experiment with them and figure out how they work. You can see the extent of their abilities and vulnerabilities all within this level. There's always going to be rings around you to take advantage of the electric shield, you're in a burning forest, you're bound to find some use for that fire shield, and like I mentioned just a minute ago, you even have little spots of water to play around with the bubble shield. And these also show you how well fire and electricity work with water. And while this is just a tiny detail, the game wants you aware of what shield you are bringing into what environment. They even subtly design challenges around this. Even in this first zone, the fire shield comes in handy as early as that first mini boss encounter. Normally you'd have to dodge this flamethrower, but with the right shield, the fight's over in seconds. And it's oh so satisfying to take down the machine that wrecked this paradise. Well, one of them, anyway. As you can see, if you're paying attention to the background when things were first set ablaze, the sky is filled with machines just like this one. And this guy was just a minute 
mini boss. Oh, and that reminds me, if you had played previous Sonic games before, this is another new thing we have. Mini bosses at the end of the first acts. Before this, you'd just zip through a signpost, maybe grab a giant ring and wait for the next stage to pop up. Here, the game just gets you right back into the action. And again, if you're a seasoned player, you might have noticed the bonus stages aren't acting the same way either. The star post will get you into a bonus area, but you can't grab emeralds here. Just rings, extra lives, shields, stuff like that. When I was much younger and still fairly fresh to gaming, these things would be a lifesaver in a pinch, but they still require you to have some rings before they grant passage. So collecting a certain amount of rings is still important, but no matter how many you collect, the end of the act doesn't have a giant ring waiting for you no matter how many of its smaller counterparts you've collected. As you've probably noticed by the time you got to this point in the stage, the special stage rings are actually hidden within the levels this time around, giving you the biggest incentive to explore. And if you somehow missed every single one of them up to this point, the game will actually force you through a tunnel, blasting you through rock walls and smack dab into a giant ring, making sure everybody knows that these giant rings exist, and yes, sometimes you have to run through some walls. And the special stages themselves are also completely different from every other version from the previous games. It does continue the tradition of a more 3D behind the back approach, and if you don't know what you're doing, this can be a little frustrating at first. It took me a little while as a kid to wrap my head around how these things work. You collect blue spheres, but you can't touch the red ones, but the blue spheres will turn into red ones once you touch them, and they have a lot of these suckers set up in fields. And if you didn't know that collecting only the outer perimeter of the spheres turns them all into rings, you might find yourself a bit frustrated. And if you were a dumb kid like me and you didn't understand for the longest time that Sonic doesn't move freely, but actually makes sharp 90 degree turns on a grid pattern, yeah, it can be a bit annoying if you're a dumb baby. But once you understand the rules, this is by far the best of the classic special stages, requiring a lot less dumb luck, but still a good amount of quick thinking and fast reaction. It requires you to think your problems through instead of memorization and constant failure. And even if you do screw up, the zones are littered with giant rings, giving you plenty of chances to figure these things out until you finally have the skill necessary to be rewarded with the coveted Chaos Emerald. You get taught all of these mechanics, old and new, within this first zone. And we still haven't even come to the encounter with Robotnik, which is an awesome introduction compared to previous games. You first get chased down by an airship raining down missiles, then you see your enemy looming in the background through the trees, and then finally bursting through a waterfall, burning down the bridge to make sure you can't escape, all while within this intimidating machine, reflecting the fiery aftermath of his attack just off screen. Like I said, they do a great job of establishing the threat of Knuckles and Robotnik all within this first zone. They teach you all of this regardless of the character you play. Like I mentioned before, Tails can take full advantage of his abilities here, and we'll get to Knuckles in due time, because again, at this point, we had no idea we could play him here, but the developers still plan for him in the future. He can take his unique skills to brand new places here as well. What I find interesting is despite all these new ways you can navigate the environments, it never deviates away from the core simplicity Yuji Naka strove for since the original Sonic game. All you ever need is the directional pad and a single button to accomplish anything. Jumping, flying, gliding, climbing, spin dashing, any of Sonic's three shield abilities. They manage so much with so little. Now, if you've never played this game before and it sounds like a good time, I recommend just stopping here and playing for yourself. I doubt it'll be quite as impressive to a newcomer as it was to a little kid in 1994, but you should experience this all the same. I just wanted to talk about how great of an introduction this particular zone was compared to other games, and it certainly doesn't fall victim to the claim that Sonic games go downhill after the first zone. You will get wildly unique environments and challenges with each each and every act in this adventure. Once the first zone is done, the game throws you right into the pool that is Hydrocity, or Hydro City. Do we have an official word on what that actually is supposed to be? You know what? Doesn't matter. Sega can't even keep their own cannon straight. Who cares? Now, what's interesting about this level is, while Sonic 1 made the water zone a challenge halfway through the game, and Sonic 2 made water avoidable if you were good enough, Sonic 3... Well, you remember how I said the first zone kind of lets you doggy paddle in the kiddie pool? Well, I hope you learn to adapt, because the second zone's just going to shove you right into the deep end. At least the other games let you jump in at your own leisure for the most part. Third game's like... Well, good luck! You have to admire how they took one of the most complained about components of the previous games and just shoved your face in it and gave you a swirl. And maybe you don't hop in in your own leisure like you do in Labyrinth Zone, but you very quickly learn that this level is way more fun than Labyrinth ever was. It's not without its hazards, but thanks to great level design and that fantastic bubble shield, the theme park that is the Sonic Zones finally added a water park that's fun to splash around in. And speaking of theme parks, they actually use a carnival theme for... <clears throat> Alright, fine, we 
Can't skip Marble Garden. Sonic's never had the best luck with Marble themed levels. I mean, the level's fine, but it feels like the weak link in the lineup. There are a lot of silly gimmicks through the level, including fake springs, crushing columns, a giant morning star that greets you right at the start of the level. Hey, how you Island doing? Island justice. And this annoying spinning top thing. Now, these are fine if somewhat frustrating or, again, useless. It's not gonna break the experience. It can just feel somewhat jarring compared to all the loop de loops. And I don't think Marble Garden is quite as bad as people make it out to be, but it's not the best either. I honestly feel like you're gonna have a better time playing this level as Knuckles or Tails as opposed to Sonic, considering how vertical this entire thing is. But this level does not get anywhere near the grief Carnival Night does. You come in expecting something like Casino Night, which, when I think about it, feels pretty out of place compared to the rest of Sonic 2 and much more in line with something you'd find in Sonic 3. But in comparison, Carnival feels cramped and linear, which is crazy when you consider just how much time you're gonna spend traversing the zone. And this is, of course, where we come across the barrel. And yes, geeks, I know, it's super easy when you know what to do and some of you figured it out so quick and we're so proud of you. But that's not the point. It's bad game design in an otherwise beautifully crafted experience. The game doesn't do a great job teaching the player how to tackle this obstacle because, well, there's nothing like this anywhere else in the adventure. And there are other barrels prior to this one, but a majority of the time they don't share the same physics as this one. So what's the problem with it? Well, a lot of us new kids at the time got to this barrel and just couldn't figure out how to get past it. You'd play around with it for a bit and it just wouldn't go anywhere. And if you're playing with Tails, you notice he's jumping up and down on it. So a lot of us felt like, okay, well, obviously it's pushing down quite a bit when he jumps on it. So obviously I just have to do that. And you could do this to the point where you could start seeing the rest of the level. When in fact, all you had to do was press up and down on the directional pad to get a swinging motion going. Normally, this is something I would shrug off because really, yeah, once you calm down and just push up and down, you're gonna get the idea. Sonic can only do so much. You're bound to figure it out eventually. And once you know the simple trick, it's right back to the fun. But I distinctly remember the first time I came across this as a kid and it was beyond frustrating. And honestly, I'm kind of glad to know that other people out there had that same frustration. And yes, guys, I have seen that barrel mug and yes, I do want it. That has a brilliant piece of merchandising. All that rambling aside, I really, really, really love how this level looks. The screenshots for this place were the first thing that caught my eye when I was waiting for this game to come out. And I still love the aesthetic. Outside of the barrel, it's still a pretty fun time. There's a lot of cool stuff happening here. Despite the stupid barrel, still one of my favorite levels. From here, we get Ice Cap Zone, a fan favorite, and for very good reason. This is one of the only tolerable ice themed levels in just about any game of that era. And that's probably because they don't have any slippery physics, which is a common place for platformers. And that's not to say there aren't clever ice-based hazards and designs, but it's really well put together. A nice balance between platforming and speed. Gorgeous aesthetic, fantastic music, all around A+. After that is the final level of Sonic 3, Launch Base. And you can see in the background the behemoth Star Wars reference that is the Death Egg. Now these games have always done a fantastic job using the backgrounds of zones in creative ways, and it's now also a storytelling device, as you noticed with the firebombing earlier in the game. But here, you move closer and closer to the Death Egg as you go on. And as you can see, it's in the water, and as the level carries on, you eventually will be as well. And this is something I should point out. Not only do they do a much better job of implementing the water mechanics, but they have more water than any other classic Sonic game. Outside of Marble Garden, there is water in every single stage. Obviously, they wanted to show off that nifty bubble shield, but I thought it was interesting that there's more water than ever, but somehow nobody ever talks about it being a problem when I hear about it nonstop when talking about Sonic 1 or 2. Looking back on it now, I have to give Sonic Team a hand for completely turning around my views on such a notorious mechanic. Anyway, back to the level at hand. All around, it's a fun time, but again, if you're playing Sonic 3 on its own, there's nothing here that indicates this is the final stage. Nothing feels imminent or desperate, and the music's fairly chill. It's not even close to being the most challenging level of this game. It's not until the very end of the level do we see some shakeups to let the player know that things are going down. Knuckles started off this adventure by being a mugger and has graduated to a full-on terrorist as he just takes down an entire building with a bomb in an attempt to murder Sonic. Right after that, you have a fairly standard fight with Robotnik, and then you jump into his hovercraft. Okay, well, from here you confront Knuckles, finally. Now, not how I expected it to go, 
So imagine it's 1994. Sonic and Knuckles hasn't even been announced yet. You're playing through this game for the first time, and this little red rat man has been bothering you this entire time through this whole adventure. And it culminates in this weird cutscene. This is, this is pathetic. The player never interacts with him directly. And all that's left is a tacked on battle with Robotnik and a Sonic screwdriver and gropey hands. And after all that build up to the death egg through this entire level, we just see it falling out of the sky without ever really doing anything. Previously, Sonic had to fight a robotic double of himself in a giant mech Robotnik without any rings in the Death Egg. And in CD, he had an incredible race against Metal Sonic before storming the challenging Final Fortress that was Metal Madness. Even the first Sonic game had a sense of drama as you stormed an industrial death trap only to be thrown into an underground ruin you had to fight your way through. Here, Sonic doesn't even make it into the Death Egg. Knuckles finally punches something, does no damage, falls in the water, and I guess everything's fine. I remember when Sonic 3 first came out. I could not wait to play it. I fell instantly in love with this new art style. I loved the aesthetic of the zones and, and finally had a bonus stage that I could beat with enough practice. It was prettier than Sonic 2, no doubt about it, but like I said right at the front of this video, I could tell something was missing. On its own, Sonic 3 is a fantastic game that's missing some of that endgame flair that really made Sonic 2 shine. But if you treat it as a midway point for an even bigger adventure, well, that's something else entirely. And to follow in that game's amazing footsteps, steps, we're gonna have to wait a little while before we tackle the second half of this game. Toot toot Sonic Warriors!